Okay. Is everyone ready? Let's give a big round of applause for all the guys from Naughty Dog. Wow. Um, I want to just take a few minutes to give you a survival guide and explain kind of what this event is. It's a little bit of a unique event that we've been doing for almost about two years. Um, thanks to Alex kind of setting up, let's do it. The event's called Headspace. And what that is, is it's a way for us to take artists that are extraordinarily busy, that really don't have a lot of time. If they take time for these things, they're usually taken away from their families or free time. And we wanted to bring them out and introduce them to you, uh, audience, and give you the opportunity to kind of interact with them. So what each of the artists is gonna do is give you a little bit of a kind of story about how they got here or what's important to them or what it's like to work where they're working and kind of casually go through this. In a way, it's a lot like having a drink or, or sitting in a dinner with uh, you know, a couple of guys and girls from the studio. Um, we will not be covering Uncharted 4 for the most part. Uh, we ask that you respect that and please try to field your questions away from that. However, we do really want you to be very active in asking a lot of questions. Um, each of the panels will last about an hour. We'll reserve about 15 to 20 minutes at the end so that you can ask whatever question it is to the artist that you want. Um, some of the artists may field questions during the event as well. If you could, please stand up and raise your hand. I will walk over to you with a microphone. We are streaming this tonight. Um, it is hashtag Nomen if you're watching online. We'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, we're really excited about being able to share some of the events that we do here. We do a ton of events and they're a lot of fun. And that's really what we want tonight is for the presenters and you guys have a lot of fun. Um, we have one or two presenters that are presenting for the first time. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And be as rough as you want, just if you ask what brush they use, I will tackle you. Um, <laughs> so uh, without that, we'll be checking in just a little bit. I'll be somewhat moderating tonight, um, but we're gonna really leave it to these guys to kind of talk about what they feel is important. Thank you so much for coming out. And um, uh, again, I really wanna give a round of applause to Noman for being able to hold these events and bring them to the audience uh, just across the world. Um, so one big round of applause for Alex Alvarez and the team that put all this together. I'm going to turn it over to you guys now. Thanks, Travis. Uh, so we're the character team. We're, we're a sample of uh, people from different disciplines on the character side. So we're going to go through that side, and later on there's a concept environment. And uh, we got, like, we're, so we're only on the character side ourselves here. Uh, my name is Adam Scott. I'm a character artist. Uh, beside me here is Yibing Jung. She's, she's pretty much in part of the shading for the character side. She's done some environment shading too. And this is uh, Hans Godard, who's our, one of our character TDs. Uh, he does a lot of the, the rigging and skinning and tools for the character, helps my pipeline a lot. Uh, so a um, little bit about myself. I've done uh, just over nine years in, the, in this industry. I went to school very similar to something like this. I went to Vancouver Film School. I took a 3D animation visual effects uh, program. It was a one-year program. Um, every waking moment I was working in school or eating food and then going home and sleeping. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Uh, the, the guys that were in my class with me, we're all still friends. And it's crazy how much the, the students that you're, you're studying with, like, they're all over the world now. And you still have those bridges. So it's, it's super important to... Be nice to everyone, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm going to show some of the work I have here. Uh, this is from, uh, so going back in time a little bit, um, I got my first job at Hyman Studios in San Diego uh, back when I, I guess, just turned 20, so I got a second initiation of the drinking down there. But uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a fun learning experience down at High Moon. Um, Worked on Boring Conspiracy, so there's a lot, of, a lot of humans you're working on, a lot of like wrinkles and folds and anatomy and proportions, which was uh, huge and very important for this industry for, as a character artist. That's a, the that's a main thing we, we've been looking for. Um, so after a couple years there, I went up to Radical Entertainment. I worked on Prototype 1 and Prototype 2, um, some small projects after that, and then uh, been at Naughty Dog since then. Um, so I've been at Naughty Dog for about uh, almost three years now. 
and started on just the tail end of, uh, or just just when uh, The Last of Us was starting to get like heavy production. So hours were picking up, and I was able to work on some of the outfits for for Joel and Ellie. So uh, here's one of the pieces I worked on. Uh, Mike Noland was in charge of uh, Joel, Joel's head, but I was given the task for like the, the, the shirt here. Here's some, uh, here's a quick ZBrush sculpt. Uh, we're kind of restrained to proportions, so a lot of the time, as a character artist, the, you have a skeleton set up already. Um, so every, every male character, you, you pretty much have hands that you're working from, you have eyes that generally have to be in the same spot. A lot of NPCs are pretty much like cookie cutters that you're working from. You have, you have a very strong template you have to follow to make sure all the animations flow with these guys. And so with, with Joel, he has his backpack, he's got his uh, certain pants have to fit on things, his neckline has to work, the same head is skin throughout all the torsos. Uh, this is uh, Ellie, this is for the DLC. Um, I hope all you guys have played the, the DLC for The Last of Us, because I'm going to be showing some spoilers here. Uh, this is, uh, so there's a lot of different aspects to character art, like going through school, I thought it was just, I thought I was going to be an animator going through school, and I discovered that there's a, a character artist stream where you can actually just model and create assets, with polygons, and you texture them, and uh, even before I entered the industry, uh, I, I didn't even know there's people like Hans who do all the character TD and scripting, there's so many different bridges that, that fill all these uh, disciplines to get the, the game, and now there's, there's people like Yibing who do all the shaders for the, the characters. Uh, our studio our, ourselves, we have, uh, I, do, I do low poly, high poly sculpting, texturing, uh, shader work, um, some skinning, a little, like I try and learn some of the tools to help speed up my production. Uh, some studios, they have it separate where there's, there's only uh, texture artists and there's only modelers uh, for the character side. I know our environments do that. So here's another aspect. So instead of just doing modeling and texturing and all that, this is something where we worked on the uh, dynamic blood on a character, something that's always changing. It's, the smudge is going on and off. She has like a tear coming in. I'll show some video of this later on. Uh, it's the torso I worked on her for the DLC. Uh, there's actually the little bit, it's, it looks like nothing, but it, it was a pain to get the head and the, the torso seamless. Uh, not only with uh, low poly and projecting high poly normal maps and like there's a we've had a little seam here with like all the animation has to line up properly all the skinning data uh, there's a lot of different shading like the resolution for tiling something um, it got pretty crazy but we got her uh, this is uh, Robert this is his hoodie started throwing I don't know if you can see him here but I started throwing on uh, a little bit of like alpha stuff on the on the edges for phrase and stuff, and that was kind of propagated throughout some of the Last of Us, which was uh, it's nice that our engine, engine can handle little things like this. Um, this is on the PS3. Uh, this was a, a bloater variation that uh, didn't quite make it in the game. We had a bloater is a, a larger infected guy in the Last of Us, and uh, this character. We had, we had uh, so Mike Nolan made the original bloater. Uh, myself and Jay Hoon Kim made a variation of the bloater if we were to have several guys in, the, in one area, but we couldn't afford the memory at the time. So this guy was cut, but he's a lot of fun to work on. A lot of freedom. Yeah, beautiful guy. Uh, this was the, this is uh, Heller, James Heller. He was uh, the main character for Prototype 2. Uh, he had an ability to shapeshift his arms. He had, he had these powers here. So this kind of shows like a little bit more that we have to do as a character artist is that you have to work out not only model, like you, you're given a concept and you model that concept, but uh, ideas for how to do, how do we shapeshift the guy's arms. So this was, uh, we had a shoulder cap which was blended into the uh, the, the jacket with the normals and everything matching perfectly and then we had an alpha that kind of like uh, took, took out the arm and then brought in a different arm as they were switching powers. And so we had, I think there was maybe five powers and then three versions of each power we kind of going through. So a lot of different freedom on these guys. If 
fun working in ZBrush on this. Uh, this I made last year for a substance designer contest uh, to learn substance designer and a little bit of painter. Painter, painter was still beta. Uh, it was fun to try something other than the games I've been working on. You got a little deer down here. He's got a, you got a little puppy up here. <laughs> he's got some stocks or something. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, so that's it for the portfolio. Um, I'll go through some of the... So here's where the spoilers go for Left Behind. Uh, this, is, so this is one of the scenes. Uh, it kind of came last minute. We had, we had infected in this scene, infected uh, people. And they wanted this one guy to get shot in the head. And they wanted to show the dynamics of like this head blowing apart. So Neil came. He like, we want a point blank shot of this guy in the cheek. And we want the cheek blowing out. And we had a lot of things going on at one time. And like, yeah, we can get it in there. And open. <laughs> Kind of see him there. Uh, it was over way sooner than I thought it was going to be, but I still made it. Uh, so, infected one or a bunch of NPCs. Uh, this, this is a head. This is a one-off head we had. We uh, we just got a 3D scanner, so we're testing a little bit. This is this is some of my face that I projected onto the mesh just to quickly get some different forms in there. Um, so we knew this part was going to blow up. So. Selected that, basically uh, turned that into like separate different meshes. I built the inside out. Uh, we, had a, we had a rigger. I think it was Nathan Horn who skinned each joint here to a different part of that face that we can model out. Here's a quick zebra sculpt. See his little teeth in there. He's got a little tongue. Tongue's gone. Um, here's some slow motion so you can actually see what's going on. There's a little delay on this pop, and there you go. <laughs> you guys are sick. Yeah. He's got the entry wound. So we did a, this whole thing was a model swap in game. It's just like toggle invisibility. So you have to have both models loaded, both characters loaded at one time, and then you just dis disable the visibility, load the other one. Or show the other one. You show it again? You guys want to see that again? <laughs> so. That's the model swap. <laughs> he still got his little nostril in place there. But yeah, sometimes you, I'd say this guy's probably overmade for the shot that we actually had in game, but you, you make things like this so that animators have the, and, and the directors have the option to choose what shot works best for the story. And at least I get to show it off this way, so. All right, so that's that's one of the like one of the tech things that we do as a character artist, other than just modeling and texturing. Um, here's some other stuff that we worked in or worked worked on. Uh, this is uh, some animated textures. You see blood flowing on surfaces. It's not actually liquid flowing down something. You actually have to do some blends, and um, it's, uh, this is a pretty common technique in the industry. Uh, we do something like this, where this is our mask of. It's a little, I guess it's a little bit technical, it's not too bad. Uh, pretty much telling what direction is flowing. So here's, here's the original spec map. You can see the blood in white. And this is what it's going to flow to. And we're masking in that direction, which is revealing, uh, revealing both the color map and the normal map and the specular. 
so this is kind of this is kind of like how when you change the midtone in the in Photoshop, it it looks like the the values going this way. So it's, it's kind of what it's doing. Um, so I've got a compilation of that. We had a limitation with uh, doing we can only do one blend per model on The Last of Us, and we had Ellie had a crazy scene where she's crying, but she had blood on her hands. She's wiping tears away. She's, she's got multiple tears, and she's wiping blood all over her forehead, and it got crazy. We had to do, I think it was like two model swaps. We have blood flowing on her arm after she got bit. So here's the blood. We throw, this is gross. We throw, <laughs> we throw it everywhere. So that was a wipe. That was a blend mask on. You see the, the blend flowing there. That's just with those grayscale masks. You see the blood there. I think there's a tear coming down. Yeah, a little tear there. So I set up the masks, and we give it to uh, animators who animate when that mask is. Here's a cool one through the blood here, flowing that direction. A little bonus with Joel after the rebar flowing out there. Uh, this is one of the foreground guys making this one. Yeah, and that's that's what I do. You want to go, Yiving? Hello guys, my name is Yibin Zhang. Um, a little bit of my story. Um, I came to US 2008 and came for school for two years. Um, the first year of school I got in the talent development program in Disney and learned something about, like I basically apply for everything and then they say, you do look dev development. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I got a lot of professional training from there, and and then I got in the mentorship, mentorship program for map painting, you know, DreamWorks PDI, and um, yeah, learn a lot about how to do map painting. And when I graduate, I'm thinking back and forth: Do you want to do like shading works, or do you want to do like map painters? Because I have a little bit technical background, so. I'm terrified to compete with all those concept artists there who is like really good. So I choose to do shading and I got in the shading resident program uh, in Pixar and worked for like a year and a half and then got back to Disney for like a few months and, and, and then uh, come to Naughty Dog, and stayed here for like almost three years. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk about generally is, uh, actually this title should be, I will most focus on how to do shading in video games. Um, actually the title should be shading in video games, but <laughs> I forgot to change it. Um, so I will show a demo reel myself. Uh, this one will be most focused on video games and uh, some of my personal work. Um, most of the personal works are my student work, like, th how long? Four years ago? Five years ago? Uh, yeah, five years ago. So, uh, I don't know <laughs> if it's good to show, but um, uh, if you guys want to see the full length of my demo reel with my work at films, you can check my website. I will show the links later. <laughs> All right.
Thanks. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no. Okay. Yeah, that's my personal website information. So if you guys want to see anything or contact with me, here's the information. Okay. <laughs> Uh, um, the question I got a lot is, um, do you need to be good at programming to be a shading artist in video games? And another question is, what's the difference between shading in movies and shading in video games? Um, to answer this question, and now I got two screenshots. The first screenshot is Dawn of Planet Apes. That's the film my personally feel is the best for shading in feature films. And this, the one next to it, uh, Uncharted 4, my personal opinion, I think, is best shading in video <laughs> games. Uh, when it comes down to the first question, do you need to be good at programming? Uh, because most of the time, people when saw me at work, they all say, like, you, you do coding all the time. Do you have to do? programming all the time, and that comes down yes and no. Uh, because basic shading pipeline is, from movies and from games, it's almost the same. It's first you deal with the reference, and then you break down the material into different layers, and then recreating all those material to make sure they look really realistic, and creating this material individually. And that part, we separate into two parts. First is texture, and the second part is the shading model. We have to make sure those two parts look right, and then they come together and do some final tweaks, make sure the final result look realistic, and then test the, in the lighting rigs. Um, first, dealing with uh, reference, I use blue steel. Uh, it's widely used for weapons, and I use that for the example to deal with like how we find reference. First, uh, first rule is it's better to be high res as high res as possible, and because shading is all about details. Um, so if the reference is not showing the details, there's no way we can get the really good result. And the second rule is most people like uh, don't know about this is uh, when you didn't, when you f shading of material, it's better to find a range of the aging of that material. And you see in this corner they have like really new and clean uh, blue steels, and here is more oxidized or more rusty, and some of part is more scratches. So we have to find the whole range of agents of that, so we can consider how to make the material realistic, because not all the part is the same. And then come to break down the material in different layers. So that part, you need some imagination, because when you see the materials, they're not, they're all the scratches, all the dent, all the rust, they all come together. But you have to separate them by yourself, like just feel like, Beyond when this new, when it's just made it, they have no scratches, what it should look like. And then and when they get old, what it should look like. And then this part is texturing. Y you probably see that a lot because y you guys work in, like, in Norman <laughs> as a student, <laughs> right? So, so I, I'm sure a teacher teaches you how to do base color, normal, and occlusion, curvature. Um, this one part I want to mention is like uh, for this gen, we tend to make sure the base color to be clear as possible. We don't want to paint all those scratches or those dents, rust on it because you want to make sure the first layer to be new and clean. And think about when the gun was new, what it should look like. And then build on those wear and tear about that. And this part is most my job is uh, how to deal with shading models. Um, you know, all those really crazy terms like reflection, refraction, and, you know, <laughs> uh, microfacets, subsurface. Um, uh, for this uh, example, uh, because the gun is hot surface, so we only deal with the reflection here. Uh, but I will talk about others later. Uh, and then uh, when you 
finish everything and merge them together, we want to make sure to test in, in different lighting scenario and make sure it looks right. Um, here's the answer for the second question. Uh, what's the difference between shading in games and movies? Um, generally in movies, they have less um, limitation for the texture memories. And, but in games, when you come down to the final, uh, when they try to optimize it, they go really aggressively to cut down the memory of textures. So, so, but we still want them to have really good results. Um, I think maybe later the environment artists, texture artists will tell better how they dealing with shade texture memories. Basically, we use a lot of terrible textures and the vertex blending to make sure it looks like, it doesn't look like we use a lot of terrible textures, but at the same time, we can see a lot of details. And that's another example. You can see there's a lot of like details on the skin and far away you can feel like you know, the breakdown of the speculars, but they all have to be really tiny, small textures um, uh, combined with other textures to make sure it looks right and we don't have that much memory to lose. And the second limitation is how to recreate the shading model. Actually, um, it is really difficult for movie and game both to recreate the shading models, Be but they focus on different parts. The movies mostly focus on how to make the shading model more physically correct so you can look more realistic and usually, um, those part be done by uh, researchers or all those programmer, graphic programmers. And come to production, m mostly those shading models are already set up. So the shading artists, as long as they have the knowledge to know which features need to be turned on and how to use them correctly, they can make sure the final results look good. But uh, like in our games, um, for mostly for hard surface, uh, this comes to a little bit too technical. Um, uh, you know, for hard surface, we don't need to worry about all those like subsurface kind of thing, mostly dealing with specular and diffuse. So in games, uh, we, most complaints, triple A complaints use GGX specular model, which being used for a lot of films. So, so if technically, if we don't have the limitation for lighting or shadow, we can get exactly the same quality as movies for hard surface. So any of you guys have heard the uh, order 8086? Um, if you look that game and if you don't focus, if you cover the characters, the backgrounds mostly look like feel like it's in action, like live action films. That's proved the result. Like if you use GGX model for, for like games and with proper lighting and shadow, you can get exactly the same result of movies because we use the same shading models. But that, then the part gets trickier because for characters or those organic models, um, there's a lot of features uh, which use for movies. There's no way we can afford to run real time. So that's the part we do. That's the part I come along to do all those hackings and try to make sure they look like, you know, realistic or physically correct, but they're not. <laughs> all those hackings. Um, but at the same time, you read a lot of like uh, technical papers and feel like doing shopping. So you read this, it's probably work. Maybe that will work. So how do you make it prettier? I don't know. Maybe next day, we'll see. Um, uh, the last, uh, like, a uh, lot of people ask me like uh, how to be a good shading artist in the industry. Um, generally, uh, if you fit with the first Number one, like if you know how to deal with shader rules and use these features correctly, you can get a pretty good result. And that, that's the entry level for like good shading artists. Uh, for number two and number three, like dealing with how to build up shading features, 
and feed pipeline and like build tools for others. Usually, for I I think you can learn that when you're in the industry and get better, build up and like with experiences. I feel like for students, if you get number one ready, you can easily find a job. So. Um, this is one example of uh, um, how to build up tools I built for the character team uh, for them to use to deal with the characters. Uh, this is a breakdown of um, material uh, template. So you can see um, just use vertex and then turn on each layers one by one. You can get decent result of how the ground look like. And this one, uh, we turn on the fabric material and uh, adjust uh, the size of the fabric strand. And then adjust the aging of the fabric, some breakdowns, some wear and tails, and some small wrinkles, and some dirt on it and then some wetness. And this one is the leather on the pouch. Yeah, adjust the size of it. And then play around with um, the specular and also the final dealing with some agents and turn on the detail of the stitches and zippers. This is for eyes. And change the pupil size and change the like the ring, the darkness of the ring and the shadow of the flashes and then the reflection on eyes. So all those build up by code and the artists can easily just turn it on. So it's make sure they can use really easily and fast. So that's my talk. We will move on to Hans. He will show you some really crazy <laughs> videos about his work. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Uh, first, I'm sorry, but if you didn't understand Yibing correctly, it's probably worse with me. Uh, so I'm there today to talk about my job at Naughty Dog. So basically I'm character TD. Uh, what does it mean? It means character technical director. Um, uh, what is that basically? Character TD is, uh, includes the rigging. It's including the deformation system on the characters. Um, it's including the body deformations, the facial deformations, um, everything related to the animation on the characters. Uh, so I can maybe I can explain what I did before before coming to Naughty Dog. Um, so before coming to Naughty Dog, I have worked at uh, Quantic Dream. Uh, Quantic Dream, it's a video game company uh, in France. Uh, I worked. I have worked two years there. Um, before that, I worked two years, I think, at um, Illumination MacGuff. So maybe you don't know that this company. It's in France, too. Uh, it's a company who made uh, Despicable Me and uh, the Lorax. Maybe you know that. Um, so it's based in France, too. Uh, so what did I do? I, have, I teach uh, some rigging things and modeling things at uh, Goblin, Goblin School in France too. Um, so yeah, a lot of, lot of things basically. Uh, so here, yeah. what what, what's my job exactly? Um, in the character study team, we are closely working with the programmers. Um, we are working on the pipeline on the characters, the pipeline of the characters with the programmers a lot. What, what can go in the game, basically, what can't go in the game. 
Um, we are making tools. So tools, uh, some tools for the modelers, of course, some tools for the animators. We are building and maintaining the riggings, the skinning, of course. Um, we receive the motion capture data and we we make it working well with the um, the rig on the characters. Uh, we are we are working on the wrinkle, the wrinkle map setup with viewing <laughs> the models. Uh, what do we do? We are making the loads on the characters. Uh, the loads on the characters. What what are the loads? Basically, I can explain this uh, quickly. The loads are basically in the game. Uh, when you reach a certain distance, it's not necessary to draw uh, a mesh very, very expensive because if you are at 100 meters, you don't see that. You don't see the details. So the loads basically are the different loads of a mesh are the same mesh uh, reducing the polygon count with the distance. So we are working on that too. Um, so at my job, a uh, lot of R&D, a lot of math, because everything we do in the characters, everything working in Maya on the characters, we have to make it working in the game too. So every time you make something working well uh, in Maya, because we are, we are working in Maya, uh, everything working well in Maya, we, have, we need to have it in the game too. So we need the math for that. Um, so what I will do now, I can show you some tools, some tools we are using uh, at Naughty Dog. So both some tools for the modeling, some tools for the animation. Uh, first tool, the collision system. Uh, okay, so basically, the collision system, it's a node, it's a C++ node. Uh, allowing the deformation uh, a mesh colliding to another. So what we do, there are a lot of settings. We can define a ramp. Uh, or is it colliding? Uh, we can reshape uh, the shape of the mesh. Um, so here we go, normal weight. So yeah, basically there are a lot of options for that. Mm. On a character, what's the result? We did that, for example, uh, for the first three last year, I guess. So at the beginning of the of the sequence, we have that in the game. You didn't see it, uh, I know, because Drake was in the water. So that's normal. So same thing here, a bit more funny. <laughs> so as you can see, it's very realistic. Um, <laughs> so yes, there are a lot of settings of this tool. Um, the last one and this one, we can Define exactly what shape we want. Uh, so you move the ramp like that, and you get exactly that shape uh, on the collision. Okay, so that's done for the collision. Uh, what I want to show you now is the dynamic chain system. So what is a dynamic chain system? Basically, it's a, it's a tool for the animators. Um, if they have a joint, a, a joint chain or any sequence of transform, of transform or locators or, or bones or anything, they can make it dynamic. So it basically is duplicating the chain. The second chain is following the first one uh, with a second um, animation motion. 
Secondary animation motion, thank you, Yubing. <laughs> so basically, yeah, they can animate uh, anything, uh, giving some damp, uh, stiffness, and mass uh, to the initial, initial animation. So on a character, how does it work on a character? The animators can select, uh, for example, the spine rig, some manipulators like that. Okay, make, make it dynamic with the tool. Like that. And if they moved right now, Drake is dynamic, it's what we want, right? <laughs> so the next uncharted is like that, you see. <laughs> okay, so more seriously, um, if you if you work a bit like that, if you if you set up the mass, the stiffness, the damping for each chain, you can have something more realistic. For example, drag in um, what's the word for that? Gravity nestless, gravity nestless. Um, you know that? No, sorry, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> So yeah, but you can have Drake in space. Um. <laughs> so what they can do when they have something working well in the animation, they can just select the chain, bake it to animation, and they can export that in the game engine. So. It's pretty useful for t animal tails or antennas or anything like that. They can select anything, uh, look, some locators, some part of the rig, and make it dynamic. So yeah, any sequence of locator or manipulator, Anything can be dynamic like that. Okay, okay, it's done with that. Uh, this one. Okay, so we have an animation. That's the result. Uh, I did that very quickly. It's just the same animation on the left and on the right, but with some dynamic. So with a simple setting, it's uh, quickly adding... Um, a more world space animation. So when you're happy with that, you bake it and uh, it's done. The same thing with some gravity. So what, with some gravity, yeah, you can make drunk people in, uh, <laughs> with this tool. <laughs> Again, <laughs> drag, drag. <laughs> Why not? I mean, okay, that's all for you. <laughs> um, another tool I would like to show you is uh, the Laplacian fixer. So it's pretty. Um, complicated to explain like that, so we'll show you. Um, basically, if you have a mesh, you have another mesh. The tool stores um, all the angles. Uh, it's storing all the angles on the first mesh between all the edges. So if I deform uh, in a very crappy way the second mesh, I can say, okay, um, you know these vertices? I call them the anchors. Select the others, Laplacian. 
in Laplacian is fixing for you. Uh, it basically it tries to maintain uh, it tries to maintain all the angles of the original mesh to the second mesh. Fix. So the character, same thing on the character here. Um, So let's say I move those vertices. Okay, Laplacian, can you fix for me those vertices? Do it. Can be can take ten seconds sometime. Bing. <laughs> I mean, why not? If you want that, you can do it. Same thing here. <laughs> so yeah, you can kill your mesh if you want. Laplacian, do it, please. Boop. He's done. <laughs> Another example using the Laplacian tool. Um, if you have, for example, two heads um, sharing the same topology, so basically the same vertices, uh, the same number of faces, of edges, the same vertex order, um, you can use in the source the first mesh and use the second mesh in the target. So what you can yeah, what you can say to Laplacian is okay Laplacian on the target mesh um, make the, the vertices like the first mesh and make make it in a smooth way uh, So basically, copy this vertex shape to this mesh, keeping the borders, keeping the size, uh, keeping the scale in a smooth way. So basically, yeah, you can transfer a part of a mesh to another, and you don't need to smooth, you don't need to do anything else. Yeah. The same thing here. Um, let's say, okay, take those vertices. Grow the selection, so I have more vertices. I want the vertices uh, like the mesh on the left. Do it. Done. So it's pretty fast. Um, and it works. <laughs> so of course she's less nice than before, but <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Uh, two last things I can show you. Um, the sticky lips we are using at Naughty Dog. Um, so basically, this tool is, is called the sticky curve. So the sticky curve, just build a, a curve um, stickying to another. Not sure it makes sense, but <laughs> I'm sure you got it. Um, so you can say, okay, uh, I want this curve stick to the second one. Here I just did, um, 
I just use another deformer, so the curve is deforming the mesh. But the real, the real deformed things is the curve. So you can have some sticky lips very easy if you want. So on the character again, here is the result. So you can see the corner, the, the, board, mm, the corners of the mouse. Uh, so it's pretty sticky. Uh, last thing I can show you today, uh, the skinning converter. Uh, I need the sound for that, please. <laughs> so the skinning converter, the video is, uh, I think, pretty... Uh, uh, say that. I mean, I don't need to explain, uh, the video is explaining itself. Converting any sequence of mesh to skinning, so it's building the, the the bones for you. It's building the animation for you, and it's building the skinning map for uh, the skinning map for you. can try to convert it with more or less bones, uh, with more, more or less max influence per vertex. Um, so of course the advantage is uh, in the video game industry is uh, pretty huge because in a lot of engines there are most of the time we can export skinning and bones, but most of the deformers are, are not exportable in, in a game engine. For example, the collision system or, or the sticky lips itself, they are not exportable in the game. So what you can do, you convert, that to, you convert them to skinning like that. Um, So the last one is two max influence per vertex. So trust me, it's not a lot. Try to paint a mesh with two max influence only. It's pretty hard. So here what I do, um, I deform the mesh with a cage deformation, like a wrap in Maya. I make a ROM with a lot of movement, 
and I convert that to skinning. Okay, guys, that was my talk. Thank you very much. This is the most depressing event ever. Um, wow. <laughs> right? Um, you know, one of the things I've always admired about Naughty Dog is that they really take a long time to kind of put the crew of artists together. Um, the hiring process there, I think you guys are notoriously known for sometimes taking six months to bring somebody on board. Um, but once they do, they kind of give you guys the time to do what you do. And we have a lot of amazing people on the stage here at Noman, but holy cow. Wow, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> So again, um, it's hashtag Nomen if you're online. We do want you to chime in with any questions you have. But for the audience here and for you guys, um, is there anything else that you want to share? Uh, I mean, you guys do get quite a bit of a time to be able to do this stuff that you're doing. And those shaders are amazing. Um, <laughs> all the tools that you built, I, I can't believe that uh, Naughty Dog lets you come tonight. <laughs> I imagine you're going to have a lot of emails trying to steal you. Um, thank you, Naughty Dog. <laughs> Um, and as far as that, the, the first presentation, that's just so cool. You don't get to see much of that, and so for sharing that, that's awesome. We do have a few people. How many high school students are here tonight from the high school program here at Noman? Parents, I'm very sorry for that first one. <laughs> They're all looking at me going, Arr. but it's really cool what you're able to be able to do, especially in a game. Um, that game is just really, really, you guys have done some amazing stuff. So we're going to open up the floor to questions. Um, if you want, uh, who's, who's got a question? Go ahead and stand up and raise your hand, and we'll bring it over to you. Right here. There you go. Uh, this question's for you, Hans. Um, how long do you usually have uh, for writing tools like that? How long the what? <laughs> or how, how, how much time do they give you to write a, a tool f um, like that for a game? Like those? Hmm? It really, honestly, it really depends on the tools. Some of them can be done in two days, one day even. It really depends. Some of them, like the skinning convert converter like that, can take six months. Oh, wow, okay. Right, so you. it really depends on the request from the modelers or the animators. It really depends on the complexity of what they need. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, honestly, it's hard to answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. And then we'll go over there next. Hi, <laughs> I'm Elise. Um, I think this message is for, is your name Jin, right? Jin, hi. Um, so at the end of your presentation, uh, you showed us some very beautiful eyes and the very many ways that you make them look really, really realistic. Mm -hmm. Really realistic. Um, I was questioning um, the reflection in the eye. I wanted to know if that is like image-based lighting or if that's actually what the eyeball is like reflecting from the environment. Uh, I'm not sure I can say that, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like um, uh, as I said, um, for characters, a lot of things you cannot afford to okay. render in real time. So we do a lot of hacks. So That's king. all I can say. Okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> how long have the three of you been working together? Uh, how long? How long have you been here, Hans? I think I'm, I think I'm, the, I'm, I'm the last arrived. So yeah. one year and a half? Yeah. One year and a half. Basically, yeah. I was in environment mm -hmm. team for like six, seven months or something, and then go to character team. So two years. Two years for us? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Okay, go ahead, stand up. Hello. Yeah, um, Hello. Um, my question is for all of you three, is your job like laid back, like is it on demand or do you have like time to like, how should I say it, uh, you have like more free time as in like do personal projects or is it like on demand, like you have to get this done within a certain time? Uh, like for your characters, like let's say the director's like, oh, I want you to come up with a character like this and like that. And he's like, you have this amount of time. Do you, do yeah, you the, on demand do it, or you just be like, okay, we, you know, we'll, we'll take your time with it. We'll develop this character as best as we can. Yeah, if they have a, if there's something they want, and you have weekends and evenings, like you want to get it done. Oh. Um, it, it doesn't happen all the time. It happens on uh, if you're trying to ship something. You have a big deadline in vertical slice. You have E3 coming up. Uh, everyone at Naughty Dog puts the time in, and they're, they're passionate. That's what they love to do. Um, and we know that we push for something hard, and then after that, there's a little bit of break, and they they give us the weekends and stuff. So it's not it's not grueling all the time. There's it's on and off, and you try like all your stuff is going to be showcased, and so you want to make it as good as possible. Oh, so it's uh, uh, what I'm saying is it is it's not like really stressful. Stressful right. during those times? Yeah, yeah, during those yeah. times. Yeah, it can be. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got an online question for you guys real quick. Hi, so someone watching the live stream wants to ask you guys, growing up, what was your favorite game that made you want to get into the industry? Awesome question. What's your yeah. favorite? I was big in Diablo What's too. <laughs> yeah. Diablo 2 fans, give it up. <laughs> favorite game ever? Favorite video game ever? Uh, yeah, what was, the, what was the video game that inspired you, if any, to kind of get into this industry? Uh, uh, lot. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like that, um, it's hard to say. Um, I played a lot to the Resident Evil when I was a child, the, the, tom the first Tomb Raiders. Um, I remember Oddworld on, on oh, the yeah. first PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, this kind of game, I, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't play game that much, but I remember when I saw the trailer for The Last of Us, I was like, I need to work there. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tag a question on to that and just say, do you think it, do you find it important for you to be a huge gamer to, to work in games today with, with games being so cinematic and the, the kind of resolution at which you're working, the level at which you're working, um, is it important to be a gamer? Uh, you know, obviously there's obvious reasons it's helpful. What is your guys' opinion on that? Um, also? Uh, I think there's definitely a lot of things that helps. If you're if you got a passion for games, I play a lot of games, and uh, I got a buddy I work with, Corey, and he's a huge gamer too. And he he's got a lot of uh, things that you can bring up for designers, especially with multiplayer content. He's got a lot of different uh, experience with with games, and he's a lot to bring to the table. Um, playing games, you check out a lot of uh, like I'm playing through Witch right now, and you're seeing a lot of the, the hair and the tech and like the stream issues they have with the mip mapping and um, I guess you judge a lot more, and there's things that, that are really cool in games, and you want to try and match that with your own work. Um, I'm sure it spreads across different disciplines, too. But yeah, I think it's help, it helps, it's not essential. It's just like watching movies, like I watched In and Out, and that was a great movie, in, or Inside Out. Yeah. I do. Uh, I, in my mind, um, I think it's important to be passionate uh, by your work. Uh, more than your industry. I'm not sure it makes sense. Um, it's two different things. Um, um, you, yeah, I don't know to say that in another way. But <laughs> your job first, your industry after. Yeah. For me, I'm checking all those uh, beautiful images from movies and games and see like how can we get that. That's the most passion. Like, oh, this look great. How can we get that? So. 
Hi, um, I'm taking the high school program here this week and last week. <laughs> so my question was, um, a lot of the, we've had speakers come in every day and they've given some advice to the high school kids and particularly a lot about what our future education, we might want to like think about what it's going to look like, like uh, university or should we take classes here at Noman, like stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to ask, what would you guys recommend to someone our age, just starting out, trying to get into like getting our foot in the door and stuff like that? Uh, uh, I think if I'm your age, I want to do something like uh, creating stuff what I want or like uh, try to be creative and all those other skills come along. Um, don't think about finding a job or anything like right away because um, that's my opinion though. Because like uh, once you got in the industry, you focus on one part for like 30 years or 20 years, right? <laughs> but now since you are a student, you can try everything. You can do like rigging animation or build like make a short animation by yourself like be a director, right? But like, you can't go back to that anymore. So that's my opinion. <laughs> but you can, for me, I'm kind of regretted because I got in the internship program the first year and I'm like, I really want to work in Disney again. So I've built up my portfolio a lot. So I didn't pay much attention for my thesis films. And yeah, I can't go back <laughs> time anymore, so I'm just do one thing now. I'll, Thank I'll you. go. Oh. Uh, so mine was like a leap of faith. I was like, I was really hoping PFS was going to work out and 30 grand for that one year. My dad questioned me because I'm not getting a degree. I was getting a diploma. I did art growing up. I was doing all my friends' art projects. Uh, I was into like calculus and physics, and that was a fallback plan for me. And I liked I thought someone with that combo of skills can be an animator, and then it just, I just saw all these different uh, career possibilities after going through VFS. And what helped a lot was in high school, I took a tour of uh, three 3D campuses, and that kind of opened the doors to see what other options there are for me out there. Uh, not just with traditional, but to see some 3D, and this is about 10 years ago. And uh, I know everything's online right now, so there's, there's a lot of, uh, like even if you like three three D is huge and it's not going to go anywhere for games especially, so I don't know. It's up to you. I went this path and it worked out well for me. I'm happy where I'm at, but I don't know where things are at now. But I think, yeah, <laughs> yeah. How about you, Hans? I'm taking a picture. <laughs> 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 so, what was the question? <laughs> I'm just curious as to, like, a lot of the debate has been, like, should I, or should a lot of us in high school pursue, like, a four-year college, or should we go to a school like Noman for art? What should we pursue as the next step after high school? Uh, you mean, what's the best kind of... Uh, what's the best way to learn, you mean? What, what best yeah. prepares you for this? Of, of course, the school is still um, very useful. Um, it's also very important to work at home a lot. Um, and uh, what to say? In my case, uh, it's a bit special maybe, but yeah, yeah it's... Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, honestly, uh, not even not really sure what to say. Uh, you told everything. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Work at home. <laughs> Thank you so much. My advice to you is just stop sleeping. Sleep is evil. Um, <laughs>
So um, I, I kind of wanted to give a, a quick shout out. Um, a few schools have been mentioned here tonight, uh, VFS and Goblings, which is an amazing school. Um, Noman and uh, VFS, a, a few schools just went through the CG Student Awards, and Noman was awarded the School of the Year. And I, I just want to give a shout out to those other schools who participate. And I'm, I'm very glad that Goblings is not involved. Um, so if we can just give a, a quick shout out to all the schools participating and the students who participated here at Noman to be a part of that, uh, we want to give you guys a nice warm a uh, round of applause real quick for that. We have time online for one more question or in-house here for one more question before we go to the next panel. Um, I think you had your hand raised before. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, uh, um, how many... Uh, PlayStations, do you think it'll take to get to like real time rendering, like for Naughty Dog games? Uh, you mean? Like, um, basically, the PlayStation um, 4, it looks pretty like realistic right now, but uh, how many more gener console generations do you think it'll take uh, for, like, to get to the processing power of, like, you know, like a movie? rendering. <laughs> Would you guys happen to know? Uh, for my opinion, I was thinking, um, you know, uh, people's standards go higher and higher, right? So nowadays, people think a oh, movie looks so real, but probably five years later, like, oh, look at movie now. It's like not real, realistic at all. You can see all the flaws when, when the standard go higher. So I think um, As long as we cannot support ray tracing or high res shadow, um, maybe it takes f several years to reach like movie quality we have now. And from that point, like if the standard of people go higher, maybe that would take longer. Um, yeah, <laughs> it uh, really depends. Really depends. I cannot predict the future. Seven. <laughs> seven. <laughs> 40 years. Uh, you guys mentioned something uh, interesting, or, or I think a, a good comment earlier in regards to being a gamer. Um, you made a comment, be passionate about uh, kind of what you're doing, like your passion is kind of what should drive you, right? Um, I think a lot of students, a lot of people have a lot of passion when they get in the in industry, a lot of inspiration when they get in the industry. When you guys are working really hard throughout the year, whether you're crunching for E3, you're trying to get this game out, you're working really long hours. I think everybody knows that's a part of this industry. Um, how do you guys stay motivated? How do you prevent burning out when you've been kind of grinding away? Is there anything that you do particularly to keep yourself motivated? Are you doing anything outside of the studio? Mm. I, tr I try and keep a balanced life. Uh, I try not to work weekends. Um, crunch time, you kind of have to sometimes. Uh, having like a nice clean schedule and then a lot of communication as you're progressing through uh, production helps a lot. Uh, but also, you want to have the best demo you can and everyone gets really excited, especially when you start seeing uh, like vertical slice, like, uh, like captures of the game getting better and better and everyone wants everything to look awesome. Uh, I don't know. I guess some people might burn out, but it's just such a, it's a sometimes it's just a short time that you're kind of really crunching hard. Adam is really good at <laughs> balanced life. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm always like, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try to be balanced. So, not <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for me, I never really ship the game. Like, Uncharted 4 is my first game. Okay. So, the crunch time usually at demos. For me, usually, like, a few weeks. It wasn't that bad compared with movies. But, but I don't know. People said, like, last six months will be tough. But it never happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> my turn? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think it's the same thing for me. Um, I think an important thing is uh, if you're crunching, it basically means you stay late, but 
when you do that, uh, I think it's important to take the time to, to leave. I mean, make a lot of breaks, uh, go to the gym if you can, come back after, go to, to eat outside if you can, come back after. If you have to, to come back uh, late, it's important to make a lot of break uh, in your day. Uh, don't stay too much focused on your job. 15 hours uh, <laughs> at once, see what I mean? So yeah, yeah it's important to, to breathe uh, uh, when you walk. <laughs> so getting that ni nice balance in there. Well, thank you very much, guys. We're going to take a 10-minute break, but before we get a break, let's give these guys a huge round of applause. They did an amazing job.